Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this webinar uh, organized by uh, the GBIF um, Secretariat uh, on the subject of introduction to uh, data papers. My name is uh, Tim Hirsch from the GBIF Secretariat, uh, speaking from here in, in Copenhagen. I'd like uh, to uh, uh, offer a warm welcome to everybody wherever you're joining um, from whatever part of the world. Um, I'm just going to give a uh, brief introduction uh, before I hand over to our uh, main speaker um, at this, uh, for, for this webinar. Um, this is a little bit of a, a first for us. As some of you may be aware, we offer uh, what we call GBIF community webinars uh, every two months or so uh, to communicate uh, some of the main developments and activities um, around the GBIF community. Um, we are from time to time now going to be um, holding special webinars on particular subjects where we know that there's a demand for some more detailed um, uh, briefing and introduction to particular themes that, that help uh, in um, participating in, uh, in GBIF um, activities and around uh, data publishing and sharing. Um, the theme of this particular uh, webinar, um, an introduction to data papers, um, was it originally a demand that arose from uh, one of the big projects um, that we're running, the, the BID project, Biodiversity Information for Development in Africa, Caribbean and Pacific. Um, however, and it, that was in conjunction with another project that we're partnering with, the Africa Biodiversity Challenge, which is being led uh, by Sanbi in South Africa. Um, but having um, already agreed that this was a good subject uh, to focus on for a webinar, we realized that there would be demand from beyond those projects. So we've opened it up to um, a wider set of participants uh, in other uh, projects that GBIF is, is helping to run and indeed to the broader GBIF community because we know there is um, great interest um, to know more and have a basic briefing around the issue of um, um, authoring data papers. Um, just a couple of general points before I, I hand over. Um, first of all, as I mentioned, this is um, the first of what we, we hope will be other similarly themed webinars where very often um, we will be very much open to suggestions and offers. First of all, um, from those of you who would like to see us focus on a particular uh, subject, a particular issue, uh, that you'd like to hear about in, in more detail. Um, and secondly, offers uh, from people in our community to actually provide uh, presentations uh, for this, for these, these webinars. Um, just uh, in terms of the uh, mechanics of this, you've all managed to get onto the Zoom platform, which is great. Um, you will see at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A, a question and answer button. Um, if you have questions, during the course of the presentation, then put them into that box um, and we will pick them up at the end of the presentation as far as possible, deal with those questions live during the webinar. Um, but we will also, if there are other uh, questions that we don't manage to get to um, or that you submit right at the end, let's say, then we will uh, be offering questions and uh, answers to those questions uh, in materials we'll send around afterwards, which will include uh, both the presentation that you will see in a moment um, and also a full uh, recording um, of, of the webinar. Um, I'm going to hand over uh, now shortly to Lizanne Roxburgh uh, from the Endangered Wildlife Trust in South Africa who's very kindly agreed to provide the main presentation for this webinar. Perhaps just one word of introduction before I do hand over um, is that is to say uh, really what this webinar is not Please don't regard this as a webinar to introduce um, everything you need to know around data publishing in GBIF. Um, there are um, other resources. Many of you will have also be aware of other uh, courses and detailed training materials around the, the steps of sharing and publishing data. This is very specifically um, around publishing data papers. Lizanne will be um, explaining the difference uh, during her uh, presentation, 
uh, which we expect will last somewhere around 40 minutes. So as I say, feel free to put in your questions and answers and we will, we will come to them um, in, in the course of the next hour. Um, so with that, um, Lizanne, if you would like to uh, um, open your, um, your webcam and microphone, I'll hand straight over to you. Hi, good morning everyone or, or afternoon, depending on where in the world you are. Um, thanks for the introduction, Tim. So this is the first time I'm doing a webinar. Let's hope the technology doesn't fail us. Okay. Um, so to start off, I'll give you a little bit of a, um, a background to myself. I work as a scientist for the Endangered Wildlife Trust, which is a NGO based in South Africa. Um, we work on wildlife conservation issues, uh, mainly in Southern Africa. And one of the responsibilities of my job is to curate our biodiversity data sets. And um, as a GBIF associate node, it is also to publish um, these data sets to GBIF. I learned about data papers um, a few years ago, um, and I was very interested in it as a concept um, because I, as a scientist, I want to increase my publication list. Um, and so I decided to learn more about uh, data papers and um, to figure out how to go about publishing them. I felt that I wasn't receiving um, any recognition for the huge effort that I was putting into compiling and cleaning data sets and publishing them to GBIF. And I thought that publishing data papers was possibly one way to obtain that recognition. So as a result of this process, um, these are two of the, the data papers that I published. Um, the first one on the, the left is, um, about the African Crane database. Um, this is a, a data paper describing um, a data set of about 25,000 records on um, the occurrence of cranes across Africa. Um, this data set also covered a, lot, a large time span of probably about 40 years. And the second data paper describes um, satellite tracking data from Cheetahs um, in a very small part of South Africa. This data set was a lot smaller, only around 3,000 records. So in addition to these publications, um, I've also done some data paper and data publishing workshops in Uganda and also with students from several different countries across the continent. And because of this, I was asked to be a judge and a mentor on the African Biodiversity Challenge, um, where hopefully a few of you know me from. Um, as Tim mentioned, this is a project um, run by SAMBI with funding from JRS in collaboration with um, GBIF. And um, I was asked by Matt Child, who is managing um, this project, to, to give this presentation on data papers. Um, because of this link with the African Biodiversity Challenge project and also with the BID projects, um, this talk has a little bit of a, a bias or a focus on Africa, but hopefully overall it will be of relevance to everyone listening as the general concepts are the same wherever you are. Uh, Lizanne, sorry if I could just jump in here, um, just to say we are, we're seeing your speaking notes uh, on the, in other words, we're seeing you in presentation uh, in presenter mode uh, on the screen. Um, it, it's, uh, I'm not sure if, if, if it will put you off too much if you, if you select a uh, full screen without, uh, with a high presenter view. Yeah, that's better. Thank you very much. Okay, no problem. Okay. All right, so, um, Hopefully, I don't need to convince this audience um, about why one should share data. Um, I think most of you are very familiar with this. Um, you would be part of the GWIF network. You would be here because you've already um, gone through some training or you're actually a data publisher yourself and want to know 
more about data papers. Um, but I do know that some of you are new to the whole, to GBIF and to the concept of data sharing. So at the bottom of this presentation, um, there are two scholarly um, publications, which um, I think are worth reading. Um, and it'll give you a little bit more insight into some of the reasons why you should be sharing your data. Um, but I'd also like to bring to your attention the, um, the blog at the top, which is um, a blog written by Corey Bradshaw, who is a biologist based in Australia. Um, he publishes this blog called Conservation Bites. Um, and in this particular blog post, which was published in January of this year, um, he discussed about sharing data. Um, I think this is really worth reading, and um, I particularly like this quote from Corey where he says, while data theft can occur, in reality it is unlikely that anyone would bother, mainly for the simple reason that in most cases, data availability is not the limiting factor for scientific advance advancement. Another reason why this should not worry you is that far too few of us have the time to publish research using all of our own data, let alone anyone else's. So I think many of us worry about data theft. Um, we worry that our hard earned data will be taken and used by someone else, but really this is very unlikely to occur. A couple of other good points that Tim, uh, sorry, that Corey makes is that um, not sharing your data reduces your publication opportunities because others don't know what you're doing. If you do share, um, at a minimum, you will be cited, but you might also be contacted to be a co-author or collaborator on additional work. So it really can assist you to expand your work, your network, etc. Okay, and lastly, a very good reason for sharing data is that if you publish research based on data, these days, most journals are no longer allowing you to be a data hoarder. They're actually forcing you to, to put your data online for others to look at and, and to reuse later on. Okay, but that's enough about data sharing. Um, let's go on to, to data papers. So what is a data paper? It's a searchable metadata document describing a particular data set or group of data sets. So I'm going to keep coming back to the similarity between metadata and a data paper. They're really one and the same thing. Okay, the, the data paper is published in the form of a peer-reviewed article in a scholarly journal. And unlike a conventional research article, the primary purpose of a data paper is to describe the data and the circumstances of their collection. It's not to report hypotheses, data analyses, or provide discussion and conclusions. So if you compare a data paper to a conventional research article, essentially you write the introduction and the detailed methods, and that's where you stop. Okay, so what are the purposes and benefits of data papers? It's to provide a citable journal publication that brings credit to you as the data publisher. It's also to describe the data in a structured human readable form. This is especially important for, for reusability so that other people understand exactly how the data is structured and how you collected the data. Um, another benefit is that it brings the existence of the data to the attention of the scholarly community. So there's a lot of data out there, and by actually publishing a paper on it, you make it more likely that the academic or the scholarly community will, will actually find your data set. Okay, and then also it increases the visibility, the usability, and the credibility of the data resources that you publish. So importantly, a data paper would have gone through a peer review process. It would have a lot of people looking at the description of your methods, of, of how you collected the data, and this really adds credibility to the data that you're putting online. Okay, and then lastly, you can track more effectively the usage and the citations of the data that you publish. So you know who out there is actually taking your data set um, and what they've used it for and what papers they've published 
using your actual data. Okay, so I'll come back to some of these issues um, again a little bit later, but let's have a look specifically at um, which um, publishers actually publish data papers. So Pensoft is one of the main publishers that has been with GBIF from the outset. All of their papers are peer reviewed, they're open access, they are rapidly published, um, and they're available online and in print. Um, Pensoft journals charge for publishing, but the rates are low relative to other open access journals, um, around 200 euros plus. But there are discounts for, for African authors, so they pay a little bit less than, than others. Um, another journal of relevance to Africa is the ABC Journal, um, which was previously known as Bethalia. Um, this is also a good option for data papers about African biodiversity, and they don't charge. Okay, um, but Pensoft is not the only publisher um, publishing data papers. Um, there's a long list on the GBIF website, and I've just captured um, a few of these in the next two slides just to give you um, an idea of how many journals actually do publish data papers. There are at least 20 listed on the GBIF website. Um, these range from, for example, BioInvasions Records through to Biota Colombiana. Um, there's Data in Brief, published by Elsevier. There's Data. Um, and these all range from quite high publication costs through to um, no publication costs. Uh, importantly, a lot of them I do actually have impact factors. Okay, let's hope that works. All right, so to go back to those, the list of journals um, that I was talking about earlier, um, there are at least 20 on the, the GBIF website, um, and some of them have publication costs, some of them don't, um, and some of them um, also have an impact factor. Okay, so that's the first screen and this is the second screen. Okay, so there's really a very large variety of um, journals that you can choose from to publish data papers in. I'm going to focus um, a little bit on the, the Pensoft journals only because those are the ones that I'm most familiar with, um, but you're really not restricted to, to only using the Pensoft suite of journals to publish data papers in. Okay, so just a couple of examples of the Pensoft journals. Um, there's the Biodiversity Data Journal, um, which is very broadly focused on it. Uh, sorry, uh, publishes very broadly across biodiversity science. Um, there's the Nature, Nature Conservation Journal. Um, and there are also the three Keys journals, PhytoKeys, which focuses on systematic botany, MycoKeys, which focuses on biology of fungi and lichens, and ZooKeys, which focuses on systematic zoology. Um, then, I, as I mentioned before, there's the African Biodiversity and Conservation Journal, which is relevant for um, people publishing on African biodiversity um, data sets. Um, data papers are a new article type. As far as I know, they haven't published any yet. These are not advertised on their website. Yet, um, the advantage of the ABC Journal is that there are no publication charges. And then um, a relatively high-profile journal that publishes data papers is Scientific Data, which is published by Springer Nature. Um, this is a peer-reviewed open access journal for descriptions of scientifically valuable data sets and research that advances the sharing and the reuse of scientific data. And they aim to promote wider data sharing and reuse and to credit those that share. The scientific um, data name for uh, a data paper is a data descriptor. Um, and they also have relatively high publication costs of around 1,300 euros. Okay. All right, so I'd, I'd like to outline the types of data sets that are suitable for um, publishing data papers about. So there really are no hard and fast rules about this, but um, at least I can provide you with a few guidelines. So in general, 
the bigger data sets are probably better suited to data papers. Um, strongly linked to this is that the data set should be of some significance. For example, it should be a data set that has been collected over a long time scale. Um, it might be the first data set of its kind that's been made um, openly available. It might be the entire database of an institution or, or a project. And usually these data sets are, are larger data sets. Um, so for example, if you have um, a data set that be, that's been collected from, let's say a single student project or um, a data set that's been collected on a single field trip, this will probably wouldn't qualify um, for a data paper publication. But if you had data sets collected from, say, student projects over a period of 20 years, um, that would start to be something that is suitable for a data paper. Okay, so bear in mind that publishers of data papers will also be looking to improve their publication ratings and their metrics. So they, they want to publish a data paper about a significant large data set that is going to be reused by other people and that is going to be cited. And then like any scientific publication, the decision to publish or not lies with the journal editors. Also, it's worth looking at other examples of published data papers for further guidance and ideas of, of types of data sets that are going to be suitably described in a data paper. Okay, so following on from this, um, data papers can describe multiple data sets that were collected by more than one institutional project. It doesn't have to be just a single data set. But these data sets should have some sort of unifying theme. They should have a, a geographic or a taxonomic focus or another thematic focus, for example, um, they might be data sets related to threatened species or invasive species. Essentially, the data sets should form the basis of a research story so that you can develop a coherent scientific publication from them. So they shouldn't be just a series of random data sets that have nothing to do with each other. They need to have a theme and to be able to tell the story. Okay, so I'd just like to briefly outline the steps in the publication process. So the first step is obviously to clean and to standardize the data set, to do all the usual things that you need to do to prepare the data set for publishing to GBIF. Um, I'm not going to touch on this at all. As Tim said, this is not what the, this presentation is about. I just will say one or two things about this in the next slide, but I won't touch on this again. I'm gonna focus on the steps two to four. So the next step is to prepare a metadata document. This can later be converted into a data paper using various tools, a Pensoft a writing tool or a template. The third step then is to upload the data and the metadata to GBIF um, using a, a GBIF node or a data hosting center. And then once you've done this, metadata can be exported from, um, from GBIF. And then finally, the, the metadata can be converted to a data paper, submitted to a journal, um, revised and hopefully published at that stage. Um, I've put a little star next to GBIF um, because the data and the metadata for a data paper doesn't have to go to GBIF, but GBIF is the best known data repository. And of course, we would recommend to use GBIF. Okay, so in terms of publishing data, the data set, um, this is the most challenging part of the process. And once this is done, the rest, the data paper publication itself is easy. Um, the data ideally should be published to GBIF by the Integrated Publishing Toolkit or IPT. For those of you who haven't gone through this process before, you don't need your own IPT. Data can be published through an established IPT in your country 
or through any data hosting institution. So you don't need to do this part of the process. You can give this to another institution to publish on your behalf. Once a data set is published, it will receive a DOI or a digital object identif identifier to which the data paper will refer. Okay, so this is important. You can't publish a data paper without being able to refer to the data set itself. Okay, writing the metadata, which is essentially writing the, the, um, the basis of your, the content of your data paper. So the metadata that needs to be provided when a data set is published to GBIF by the IPT forms the basis of the content of your data paper. If you write good metadata, rich metadata, this is very easily converted into a data paper. Okay, because of this, because the metadata forms the basis of the data paper, the IPT provides a tool for exporting the data, the metadata into a text file that you can edit, you can add to, and you can later submit for publication. So if you're publishing in the Pensoft suite of journals, um, this file can be directly imported into the Alpha writing tool. Um, I provided the link there, and um, it can be submitted after you've edited it. You almost certainly need to edit the metadata to some extent, um, and you almost certainly need to or want to add things to it, like maps and, and various tables and, and such. Um, if you're not submitting to PenSuite, you can obviously um, edit this uh, document and submit it to any other data paper journal. Okay, so I wanted to touch briefly on templates. There's absolutely no need to use a template. You can write the metadata directly into the metadata sections on the IPT. However, I found using a template quite useful um, and for two reasons. Firstly, if your data is being published by someone else, for example, through another institution's IPT, you will need to provide the metadata. And it's really useful to know what um, metadata you need because it can take time to look things up. For example, um, if you're providing information on funders, on, on who's collected the data, on what the methods were, um, this can actually take quite some time to compile. And I think, I think it's useful to do this upfront. And secondly, oh, well, as I've just said, um, developing a metadata can be time consuming. So it really is um, good to be prepared upfront before this needs to be um, loaded into the IPT. So um, I've developed a Word document template um, for myself, which was extracted from the um, Alpha writing tool and I can make available to people if you're interested. Um, other journals such as Scientific Data also has a, a downloadable template for their data descriptors type of data paper. Um, and this can be found on their website as well. Okay, so just to show you what the um, writing tool looks like, this is a screenshot from the tool. And essentially the tool um, lays out the data paper exactly um, as it needs to be submitted. And you can copy and paste or type your text into the relevant sections. And the sections are shown um, on the left of your screen. Um, you'll see it, it goes through um, the title and authors, the abstracts, introductions, um, methods, etc. Okay, just to give you a very brief um, outline of the, of the types of sections that you need in a data paper, um, just to give you an idea of, of what you're in for when writing a, a data paper. Um, those sections, the section headings are given in blue and under those are, are more detail, uh, more of the detail required in each section. Um, those with a star are the um, obligatory sections, the sections that you have to provide. Okay, so obviously you need an introduction, 
to your data set um, a general description of the data set, um, the actual description of the project, who worked on the project, who is the personnel, where did you receive um, funding from, um, then you get on to sampling methods, um, geographic coverage and temporal coverage of the data set. Um, and then continuing on to collection data, if your data comes from a museum, um, you can describe um, various pieces of information about that collection. Um, usage rights, um, what can people do with your data? Um, the data resources, this is where I mentioned the DOI earlier. Um, this is where you provide the link to the actual data. Um, and the number of data sets that your data paper is referring to. As I mentioned before, it doesn't just have to refer to one data set, it can be referred, it can refer to multiple but linked data sets. Okay, and then any additional information, for example, what papers have already been published from this data set? And then the last uh, few sections are, are typical sections for a scientific paper. Um, acknowledgements, what uh, contributions the authors made to the writing of the data paper, references, etc. Okay, so just a quick um, screenshot of how to export from the IPT. This is a very simple process. Um, so this is a, um, a screenshot of the Sandy IPT, and this is a data set that I've been working on. Um, this will be the landing page for the data set, and if you look down towards the bottom of the screen, um, you will see there's a heading which says Downloads, um, and you simply click on um, Download Metadata as an, as an RTF file. Um, it will download the metadata that you've written into the IPT as a text file. And you can then, as I said, you can edit this and then submit it to the data paper journal. Okay, and then on the other end, how to import this text file into the alpha writing tool. Um, again, this is a, a screenshot um, of the various options in alpha and um, in the middle, you can import a data paper manuscript from a GBIF IPT metadata. So it's as simple as that. It's literally uh, one click to export and one click to import. Okay, so the alpha writing tool does require a little bit of an investment and time to learn how to use, but I recommend that you persist. Um, don't be put off if it's a little bit tricky. Um, it's worth the effort as the result is a perfectly formatted document that is ready for submission. Okay, so to come back to um, the, the benefits of, um, of publishing data papers. So why go the extra mile to publish a data paper? You've put your data onto GBIF, it's up, other people can use it. Okay, it takes a bit of time. Um, it usually costs a, a bit of money to publish your data paper. So why do that? Why bother? Well, firstly, it improves the reusability of your data by providing a rich source of metadata to the user. Um, ideally, um, richer than you might normally put onto GBIF. Um, and currently, data sets are not being properly, properly cited. Um, for example, if you um, look at the study that I've mentioned at the, at the bottom or that I've cited at the bottom of the slide, um, they found that data sets are not being properly cited, um, especially when only published to GBIF and not accompanied by a data paper. So the data paper provides a mechanism for proper recognition or proper citation of you as the data publisher. And as I've mentioned several times, um, the big part of the work in publishing data is actually getting the data ready for publishing to GBIF. Once you've done that, writing the metadata and writing the, the data is actually the smallest amount of, of effort in the whole process. Um, and hopefully, um, I think it is worth it. Okay, so some uh, resources which are provided 
kindly provided by GPIF. Um, there's a link to, to data papers if you want to read a little bit more. Um, there's a list of data hosting institutions that you can use if you don't have your IPT, your own IPT. Um, there are some resources about metadata. Um, there's also um, a link to the Alpha Writing Tool, which includes tips on importing your metadata from GBIF IPT. And then there's also some information on um, data sharing with GBIF. So thanks for your attention and any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Lizanne. Uh, that was a really clear, excellent presentation. Um, I'm going to pick up just on some of the questions that have um, come in, uh, taking them in turn. Um, so the, there's a question um, from Gasha Kamba, what's the username, uh, saying, first of all, didn't quite get what the price was at Pensoft and um, who would be eligible for the discount you mentioned. In terms of the prices, actually, I think you put that question in before we had uh, sorted out the um, the problem with, with uh, the slides showing the list of journals. If you follow the link that Lizanne gave at the end, um, there is a web page uh, on the um, GBIF website, which um, gives a list of all of the journals, including Pensoft and the last prices that we have for them, um, although you should check all of those with the publishers. I, I will go back to ask, check with Lizanne. You mentioned, Lizanne, that there is um, some discount for uh, African authors that Pensoft applies. Could do you say anything more about that? Um, I can't quite remember uh, the details of that, but yeah, I think you just need to contact them, say that you're an author from an African institution, um, and they do give a considerable discount, but I think, yeah, I can't quite remember. I think okay. it was sort of half price. Right. Okay. I think what we can do then as well, maybe is, I think we, we, it's good for us to know that as well. Um, we will publish, uh, we will contact uh, Pensoft and, and, and provide uh, more information about that after the, after the webinar. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Then uh, there was a question from Abel in Rwanda. Um, and uh, he asks, um, could you explain more about the data paper and the difference between it and ordinary papers? Again, that was a question r relatively uh, early on in the webinar. Um, so I I'll have one go at uh, summarizing the answer and then perhaps Lizanne can, uh, can add something. I think the, the main thing to uh, bear in mind in terms of the difference between a data paper and a conventional research paper is that a data paper is essentially a description of the data itself, uh, which may be one or more data sets covering things like uh, the uh, methodologies used for collecting the data, uh, the, the geographic coverage, taxonomic coverage, etc., and um, the in potential importance of that data. What it doesn't do is attempt to come to any um, research conclusions as would be a requirement in, in any conventional research paper. So it's a, a detailed description of data without a requirement um, to set out a hypothesis or come to research conclusions. Lizanne, is there anything you might want to add to that? Uh, no, I think you've described it perfectly. Okay, so hope, hopefully that makes it slightly clearer. Um, so then uh, we have a question, another question from Gasha Kamba saying, are there publishers specifically interested in data papers describing data from herbarium digitization? Um, well, I mean, I think several, certainly uh, that um, uh, the digitized resources from, from herbaria was, would be a, um, a fairly uh, uh, common type of data paper that we would see being accepted by several of the journals. Um, Lizanne, is there any, are there any particular journals that you think um, would be more interested in uh, herbarium data rather than other types? Yeah, I th well, I think PhytoKeys for sure. And if it's an African data set, the African by uh, the ABC journal. Um, but yeah, just look through that list in, on GBIF. Um, 
I think there'd be a couple. Yeah. Uh, but ones. certainly that, that, that uh, type of data set would be a, a, a typical um, subject for a data paper. Then we have a, a question from someone just described as team member. Uh, and the question is, what keeps us from publishing all data sets in GBIF as data papers? Is it the costs? Uh, well, that's a good question. Um, I, I think, I mean, I would say probably, yes, it is. It's partly that there is a, a, a cost consideration in, 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 mo in many cases. It's also, it, it is additional effort. Um, so um, you, could, you could argue that it would be great to publish all data sets as data papers, but remember also that there is a process of peer review. Um, so you are submitting the data paper to a journal for acceptance and, uh, and peer review. So there is, it's an additional step to um, good publication practice through GBIF. But Lizanne, anything more you would add to that? Yeah, I think that's, that's the main thing, um, that there is a peer review process and that not all data sets are suitable for, for data paper publication. As I said, they do need to be of some significance. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so then uh, Jackie Mbawine asks, uh, with data papers, do you necessarily have to include your raw data in the publication or the metadata description is enough? So just to clarify then, uh, the data paper itself would not um, include the raw data, it would be referred to in the data paper. So essentially, the data paper is the metadata and the raw data is what lies behind it. So um, in that sense, you are, you are not um, including the, the data itself within the publication. So if you're a if you're reading the journal, um, you wouldn't, you would certainly expect a link to where you can find the raw data, but you wouldn't expect the data to be directly attached to the data paper. Uh, is, uh, and there's a, a, a good question from Alejandra who asks, is the data peer reviewed as well? I think it's, I'm glad somebody asked that because I think it's an important point to make that in the pure data, the data paper itself, the peer review process is not a peer review of the data, right? It's a peer review of the description, uh, the, the, the robustness of, of the, 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 the metadata itself. I think, I mean, in some cases, I have heard that some peer reviewers will then take the opportunity to look into the data itself and, and perhaps make some observations that help to improve it. But, um, and Lizanna, you know, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I would say that certainly the peer review of data papers is, we shouldn't take as a peer review of the data itself. Yes, yeah, I agree with that. But um, when you submit a data paper, you have to provide access to the data to the reviewers. So they, yeah, they, as you say, they might have a look through it, but the peer review is mostly around the metadata. Mm. And I think, I mean, there are continuing um, discussions around the community about uh, what type of uh, mechanisms we might be able to set up that is something closer to a peer review of data itself. But that's that's not really the that's certainly not the main purpose of of data papers. <clears throat> um, then another question: uh, Can I make one data paper that describes many data sets published in GBIF, hence many DOIs? I think that's that's fine, right? And PenSoft is okay with that. Yeah, you don't have to doesn't have to be a one to one mapping yeah absolutely yeah as long as they have some thematic focus i mean they shouldn't be completely random and not in any way following a particular theme yeah uh and then the last question that we have on our list here from johnny is uh if i upload my data to the ipt will it publish automatically 
um, or do I need to go to external journals to publish it? So just to break that down and maybe just clarify, um, if you upload the data to the IPT and you press publish, it will publish um, automatically to GBIF. It will become a published data set in GBIF, including the metadata, so long as you've registered your institution um, and taken the required steps uh, to format your data correctly. So it, it's the, the first part of the answer is yes, it will publish to GBIF automatically, but it won't automatically become a data paper. Uh, to um, Once you upload the data through the IPT, um, if you want to publish a data paper, you then need to take those additional steps that Rosanne described of, um, uh, of, of for, um, um, exporting the, um, the text and then submitting it to the journal for peer review separately. So um, yes to publishing through GBIF, but no, you need additional steps uh, to publish it um, through a journal. Uh, and then a final question, one more, uh, from Ngoran, who asks, um, is, the dis is the discussion very necessary in a data paper? I think I would put that to, um, to Lizanne. So I presume the, the section that's described as the discussion part of the, of the text, how, in your experience, how important would you say that is in a, in a data paper? So in a data paper, there isn't a discussion section at all. Um, it's really just an introduction and a very extended methods section. So you, you're not discussing any results from your paper, from your, from your data set. Um, it's really describing the methods of how you collected it, who was involved, who are the funders, where is this data set available online. So really no, no discussion, no analyses in your data paper. So this means you can take your data set, you can analyze it, you can publish a normal scientific paper, and then you can take that same data set, put the data onto GBIF and publish a data paper from it. So that quite fairly different from, from a standard um, scientific publication. Okay, um, thank you very much, um, everybody. Um, I'm just having a quick look in the chat box to check if, um, there's any additional points we need to address there? Uh, I'm sorry, there is one more question. Um, I'm not saying. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, sorry. Okay. Um, okay, so Sam is asking a question uh, How about risks of data being stolen? Um, so Lizanne did, did address that right at the beginning of her presentation, but perhaps. Could you maybe pick that up again and give your, your views on that question, Lizanne? Sure. So, um, yeah, it's always a worry for scientists that, that someone will take a paper and, and will steal it and use it in some way. So in many ways, it's recommended that you actually take your data, you analyze it, you publish something, and then once you've published um, a normal scientific paper, you put it onto GBIF or onto any sort of open data platform as quickly as possible. Um, of course, there's always a, a very small risk that someone will steal your data, but you know, as I said in the beginning, it's very unlikely. Um, there's, there is actually a lot of data out there um, and data availability isn't really an issue. Um, and you know your data best. I think you know, the likelihood of, of someone else stealing it is small. They're, more, they're much more likely to contact you to say, you know, I'm really interested in the work you've done. Please, can you provide more information? Can we collaborate in some way? So I think, I think the, the benefits of, of um, publishing your data and sharing your data far outweigh the risks of, of someone seeing it. And I, I also think there's maybe, there's almost a kind of philosophical question here about what do you mean by stealing data? I mean, I think um, once you mm -hmm. accept the the benefits um, and the fact that it's the right thing to do uh, for um, da data um, uh, that adds to uh, global knowledge about the distribution of species to be regarded as a, a public good. I think once you accept that argument, um, you're putting the data out there to be used. Um, therefore, it's difficult to, how do you steal something that's 
that's a um, that is is you know there as a as common property if you like I think the maybe the just the thing to add to that is that um, through the process that's been developed through the Jeep of community and collaboration with journals as well I think we can provide um, all the facilities to be um, if you like a good a good citizen in terms of use of data um, through citing data properly according to what's recommended and therefore the reward that comes back for the act of sharing data in in a in a fair world um, is that the use of that data will, will will come back and provide some some benefit for you as a as a data sharer but um, yeah so I, I think um, you know you in a sense you first have to um, accept the the benefit and the, the the good practice of sharing data and then I think the concept of stealing data um, maybe becomes less less relevant or less of a problem but I think but the earlier point of this and make of course you need to make your own decision about at what point in the research cycle um, you you wish to um, uh, to make the data public um, so I think we're just coming up to uh, to the the hour uh, so thank you very much uh, for everyone um, who took part uh, in the webinar we'd really appreciate um, uh, feedback on um, uh, how whether you thought it was useful and anything you'd like us to uh, to bear in mind for uh, future similar webinars and as I mentioned at the beginning um, any ideas for subjects that you would like us to cover and any offers to uh, uh, to provide presentations uh, would be much appreciated. We'll be uh, circulating the details um, of the, um, the recording and indeed the, the presentation and questions and answers um, after the webinar. So thanks again to um, Lizanne for a great presentation and I hope everyone has a, a great day.